I still cannot believe that it's been a whole academic year. At heart, I'm still that same bumbling biochemist, that same person on a mission to make biochemistry accessible for all and fun, of course. But I've also found myself really having kind of changed in how I think and how I approach things. And I kind of my internal voice has gotten more teacherly and I'm more conscientious about how I explain things to make things make sense to others than myself. I find often I'm making kind of like assumptions in my head that aren't in other people's head. And so I'm working on it. Speaking of working on it, teaching is hard. And it hasn't always been easy. There's been ups and downs. And so I'm so, so grateful to have really patient students who are just fantastic people. And so the students I have this semester, I had last semester as well. So I've had them for two semesters and they really just are extraordinary young adults. And I'm so excited to see where they go in their future. But let's take a look back at the past year, or I guess 10 months. One of the things that I actually found the most surprising was that my favorite thing to teach turned out to be metabolism. I say this was surprising because I was terrified of metabolism. And I always thought it was like this super duper complicated thing. And it was just really overwhelming. And well, part of it was that when I did undergraduate biochemistry, I took like the one semester biology version, not the two semesters where you actually get a whole semester of metabolic biochemistry. And so then when it came time to teach a whole semester of metabolic biochemistry, I was pretty intimidated. But having coming at it after having years of training in biochemistry and biology and structural biology, even though I wasn't studying those specific things as much, I really had a perspective of the bigger picture and the ability to integrate things. And I realized that similarly to organic chemistry, how it looks really overwhelming, but there's all these like shared principles at heart. If you understand those shared principles, you can understand basically anything without having to try to memorize a bunch of stuff. Well, similarly for metabolism. And so I tried to teach metabolism in a way that my students got that broader picture too. Um, I realized that some of the things I did weren't as helpful as I hoped they would be, and that some of the things probably just made sense to me, and some of the things they probably needed a little more background for. But next semester when or next year when I'm teaching the same things again, I'm going to implement all of this stuff that I have learned from my amazing students this year um, in order to kind of help. So my students have really been the true teachers teaching me um, how to best, most effectively teach them. And so I am incredibly grateful for that. I'm also incredibly grateful for my supportive colleagues, as well as my family, um, the IUBMB for their supports, especially Dr. Alexandra Newton, who if it weren't for her um, running into me in the hotel lobby at an ASBNB meeting and telling me that she appreciated what I did, um, I don't know if that was like, I when I was just like starting out as the bumbling biochemist, I don't know if I would have had the the confidence to to really get to where I am today. Speaking of where I am today, it's not exactly where I thought it would be a few months ago in terms of research, but it's so much cooler. And I was so proud just the other day, my research students, Haley and Bobby, got to present our work. And so I wanna tell you a little bit more about kind of where my research focus has shifted to as well as some cool um, collaborations and fellowship and things like that. But no, don't worry, I'm still at St. Mary's College and I love it here, love it here, love it here. And I'm really looking forward to a second year. But let's get back to the research. So you might've remembered that I was talking, when I first was talking about doing research at St. Mary's, I had these ambitious plans to come up with cheap and efficient ways to study translation, the process of making proteins. And well, it turns out that my methods weren't, um, we didn't, it just wasn't working out. So Haley and Bobby tried diligently to try to get this to work, but it just wasn't working. And it was also really expensive, even though we were trying to make it cheaper. And so we're like, okay, scratch this. What else can we do? And well, I had heard about this maladehydrogenase cures community. So maladehydrogenase, it's that central protein at the heart of your tricarboxylic acid cycle, your TCA, your Krebs, your citric acid cycle. Choose whatever you want to call it. That maladehydrogenase is super duper important. And a lot of people think it's super duper important. So we're looking right here and right here. 
A lot of people say it's super duper important, including a lot of undergraduate educators. And so there's this thing called the MDH Cures Community. I don't know if you've heard of a cure before, but basically it stands for Course-Based Undergraduate Research Experience. And it aims to give students an authentic research experience during the like during the class lab period. So rather than doing a separate like cookbook recipe lab each week where every week is a totally different thing, you have a semester long or maybe even a two semester long project where you really are doing research. And so the answers aren't known. You're doing research like a real researcher. So what's exciting, it shows the students how they can be like the scientists, that they can be a scientist. And it lowers the barriers to accessing that because they don't have to have time outside of class. They don't have to, like if they have a job, if they have family responsibilities, they don't need to take time outside of class to be able to get a research experience. And they don't have to overcome that hurdle, that barrier to kind of approaching a professor and asking if they can do research. So these cures are really, really great. And the community of educators who do them are phenomenal. And there's a community of educators who all are doing research surrounding maladehydrogenase. Maladehydrogenase in different species or all in human or in humans, but in like different aspects of it, maybe looking at phosphorylation, maybe looking at interactions, all these various components um, that you can study with the same protein or with versions of the same protein. And so I first learned about the, the maladehydrogenase cures community through some channels. Um, and speaking of those channels, I got connected to KP and Lauren, who are amazing. Um, so KB Proko and, um, or Proko, I, everyone calls her KP. Um, so I'm just not sure how to pronounce her last name. I'm sorry, KP um, and Lauren Genova. They're just fantastic people. Um, and I got involved with the glycolysis activity with them that hopefully I'll be able to, I'll tell you more about in the future. But I got to meet them at the ASBNB conference where I also met a bunch of people in the MDH community, um, including Joe Provost, who has been totally amazing to me um, and helpful as I try to establish a cure and getting me, trying to get me more involved with the um, MDH community. And um, yeah, so, and then ultimately getting this fellowship through the community, which I'm really excited about. It's gonna give me training this summer in order to do, um, to be able to establish MDH-based cures at St. Mary's next year or next like some academic year. But anyway, so people look at different aspects of MDH. And one of the things I was trying to figure out, like what could our little like niche be? And one of the things that really interested me was that there's not as much known about prokaryotic MDHs. So we're talking about like bacteria um, and archaea. Those ones aren't as well characterized. And there's actually a lot about it, bacteria that are not well char characterized because there's just like so many strains out there and so many, it's just, but these bacteria can do these fascinating things. And so I was trying to think, okay, well, what bacteria species should we work with? What should we do? I was um, kind of tossing around some ideas with Haley and Bobby, and I knew that we want, I wanted to do something that kind of still piqued my interest in my in wanting to help the world. I know my my very modest ambition. And so one of the things I thought was, okay, well, what could what do bacteria do that can help the world? Well, some bacteria they can do what we call bioremediation. So basically, they can clean up the mess that we make in our environment. And one of the messes that we make is like heavy metal contamination. So from factories, um, from things like this, heavy metals can build up in the soil and then it prevents things from being made there. It prevents plants from growing there um, and all around bad things. And heavy metals are really, di really difficult to get rid of because they don't like biodegrade. But it turns out that some of our little buggers, some bacteria, they can actually detox the metal in a way. So they can remove it from the environment. And this metal bioremediation is really important. And I found some potential links between maladehydrogenase and metal um, and the bioremediation. So I'm like, okay, we found an angle. Let's look at some bacteria. Let's look at their maladehydrogenase. And let's look at how that maladehydrogenase um, is involved with my bioremediation. So how does that help the metabolism of these little buggers kind of rewire in response to the presence of heavy metals and help enable them to not only resist the metals, but actually be able to kind of detox them or transform them into a form that's not toxic or take them out of the environment physically. And so one of the metals that we decided to focus on was chromium. Chromium can exist in different oxidation states 
There's chromium-6, which is really, really toxic and dangerous and really, really bad. And then there's chromium-3, which isn't so bad. And so basically, there are ways in which bacteria can reduce the chromium-6 to the chromium-3. And then that would be very beneficial because, well, bacteria, they grow really cheaply. These bacteria are friendly to the environment. They can even produce things that help plants grow in addition to kind of just cleaning up the mess. So bioremediation by bacteria can be a really great thing. And so we wanted to find, first of all, we need to find bacteria that can do this. And then we wanted to characterize their metabolism and figure out how they're doing it, how their metabolism is changing, um, and what role malic dehydrogenase plays in that. And so we ordered a bunch of strains of bacteria from a culture collection. And these strains, like all we know about them, is, well, some of them, we don't really know anything about them other than what year they were collected. Some you get like a country, some you get like it was, comes from soil or something. And so we got a bunch of strains, we screened a bunch of strains, and we actually found some hits. So we are super duper excited and we're going to start looking deeper. What's also really cool is that this assay to kind of determine whether the bacteria are reducing the, the chromium, it turns purple in the presence of the chromium-6. And so if you grow bacteria in food with chromium-6, and the bacteria remove that either by kind of like precipitating it or by reducing it to chromium-3, then that purple color goes away. I mean, the purple color only happens because you add this DPC chemical, then then you get the reacts with the chromium-6 to get the purple color. So I mean, like, it's not like they're growing in purple food, but when you take the food that they were growing in that had chromium-6 and now it doesn't make a color, well, that means that the bacteria were able to reduce it. And so that was really, really exciting when we got that result. You see that nice clear well, and we're like, oh my God, did we mess something up? Did we forget to add the chromium? And no, we did it. We did it right. Um, and so that was super duper exciting when we reproduced it, especially because that result literally came a couple days before the research po that poster, like that first preliminary result came a couple days before the pre poster presentation. We didn't have time to replicate it. And so well, Haley and Bobby were so excitedly presenting their research and it was just so great to see them. I had like this knot in my stomach that, oh my God, what if this doesn't replicate? What if this wasn't real? What if this is an artifact? So I was so, so, so relieved when it was able to replicate. And we even found a couple other um, potential hits as well. And so we're super duper excited. Unfortunately, this also came at the very end of the semester. And so Haley and Bobby, or will Bobby be graduating? Haley will hopefully do a little more with me next year. Um, but and thankfully the summer research program starts in a couple weeks. And so I'll have two full-time students that are gonna be working on this project, um, characterizing these strains and figuring out what's going on with them metabolically, as well as getting some of the malic dehydrogenase stuff up and running so we can study it in vitro, the protein in more depth. So I just wanna thank again, everybody who's been so supportive of me. And one of the people who's really, I really need to thank is Dr. Janitza Fujimori, my postdoc advisor, who was so supportive of me making the transition um, to this role at SMC, even though I was in the midst of doing research with her. And so she's so supportive. She actually came out the other week to talk to the students about um, research opportunities, how to get into grad school and things like this. And so I'm just so, so grateful to her, as well as grateful again to everybody at SMC, my family who have supported me from the very beginning, the IUBMB, and anybody, everybody who supported me, everybody who's watching this, everybody who's found my content helpful. It's just so, so great when I get feedback that you do find it helpful because really that's why I do it. I love what I do and I'm constantly working to try to be better. Um, and I'm so grateful to everybody who has helped me along the way. And I'm really looking forward to a second semester or a second year of semesters at SMC. And I still can't believe um, I still can't believe I'm here. I can't believe it's been so long. It feels like super duper long. It feels like I've been here like so long, but it's not long at all. It just all kind of flew by in a whirlwind roller coaster of ups and downs and all around. But um, we made it. Well, at least almost. I still need to do all that grading. Which, by the way, is my least favorite part of teaching. <laughs>